Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the regular afternoon council meeting of March the 14th. This meeting is being recorded live and is streaming on the District Summerland YouTube channel at youtube.com District of Summerland. All representations to council, written or verbal, will form part of the public record and be available to the public for viewing electronically or as a written record. Members of the public may access the meeting or participate in the following ways. You can uh, attend council chambers in person, and you can do so by registering in advance of the meeting by contacting the corporate officer at corporateofficer at summerland.ca to ensure there's enough space in council chambers. You can watch the meeting live or recorded, as mentioned on the YouTube, um, on the District of Summerland YouTube channel. Uh, you can register in advance to speak during the meeting. If you wish to provide comment during the public comment opportunities found under items six and nine, you are asked to register in advance by contacting the corporate officer at corporateofficer at summerland.ca with your name, your civic address, and how you will be participating, whether in person, telephone, or by Zoom. The corporate officer will provide you with further details upon registration. Those who have not registered in advance but wish to speak during the public comment opportunities may be given the opportunity time permitting after I have provided everyone who has pre-registered with an opportunity to comment. The floor will be open to those in council chambers and those on the conference line. The conference line can be accessed by dialing 778-907-2071 and entering meeting ID 506-489-9374 and passcode 485186. Are there any late items to introduce? No? Okay, so I'll ask for approval of the agenda. Councillor Van Elfen, Councillor Holmes, all in favour? Thank you, and adoption of minutes from the February 28th regular afternoon meeting and the March 4th 2022 special meeting. All of that looks good, Councillor Van Elfen. And seconder, Councillor Patton, thank you. All in favor? Thank you. Now we'll move on to delegations 5.1. Kristen Parsons and Leanne McNeil are here with us to give us a Chamber of Commerce 2021 tourism report. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thanks for having us here today. It's so nice to see everybody in person. I know I haven't had the chance to meet everybody personally, um, but uh, my name is Kristen, and I work with the Summerland Chamber as their business recovery specialist. Um, and uh, Leanne, uh, as you all know, is uh, been with the Chamber for many, many years, and she's taken a more leadership role recently um, managing the Chamber, and we are excited to be able to present this report on what has been happening for the last year in tourism. So just give me one second. Do you want to, do, you, do we have to press the No, it's red, so okay. it can speak. Awesome. So to get started, we wanted to uh, really kind of lay the foundation of what we thought would be 2021. So at the very beginning of the year, your first report in quarter one talked about the pillars of success that tourism really expected to have and work on for 2021. And those four are continuing. I just wanna make sure that the presentation is up so we can follow along, sorry. I can actually get started. I'm sure you guys have seen the presentation in your package. So the four pillars that we really thought would be 2021 started with continuing to build and rebuild connections with key partners in tourism development. 
strategies to enable tourism growth, leveraging funding programs to for key projects to support and elevate districts operating funds and for adjust and enhance communications, which was very key in the fact that we had many different things going on in our tourism industry and we had to really pivot constantly and make sure those communications were consistent and, and clear. So before we get started on what we were able to accomplish, we wanna recognize that there were five key setbacks that we experienced in tourism, in particular at the DMO over the last year. First and foremost, finances. We had a different approach to finances this year because of the difference um, in funding from the district. And the reason we recognize that isn't because of the, not just the, the loss of the funding for the chamber, but because we had the structure set up. So chamber management and uh, staff heavily supported the, the duties of the, the tourism services. So when we lost some of that staff and some of that funding, we weren't able to actually do as much under tourism as we normally have. One of the ways we've pivoted from that, and you'll hear about that later on in the presentation, is we've really separated tourism services this year and tourism DMO so that we can recognize what does it actually cost to run the DMO and visitor services separate of the chamber? What does it, what does it stand alone really look like? So that was a, a real big setback we had to start with at the beginning of the year. Second, obviously everybody in the room knows COVID mandates and vaccine cards played a huge role on our visitor services and our tourism services and what we were able to communicate to the community and the outside world about what you can do in Summerland. Staff shortages, we had full HRDC, uh, Human Resources Development Canada funding to hire summer students this year. Unfortunately, we didn't have the applicants. So that again posed some really difficult issues for us and not being able to have the people out there communicating what visitor services can do and the DMO. Extreme heat and wildfires. Again, sorry. <clears throat> One of the, the, the key messages from the province and from central Okanagan was not to travel here. We're not central Okanagan and we got kind of bottled up into that. So that was again, some messaging that we had to overcome. And then the flooding and landslides. Again, a lot of that wasn't directly on our, on our back door, but it did affect us gravely as there was supply chain and obviously the lack of visitors coming to the area. Oh, perfect, we're up and running. Just one more page, yeah. There we go. Yeah. So despite the setbacks, how did we do? We're gonna go through a couple of things on visitor services and then we'll reach over to the DMO. So under communications, we worked on crisis communications. It wasn't about why to come to Summerland. It was more about public messaging and making sure that it was consistent across all the different channels. So whether it was TOTA, whether it was DBC, we had to make sure that all of our messaging was consistent. Wildfire updates was a huge, a huge one for our locals as well as our travelers. Um, COVID mandates, resources available to business. So when I came on board in, in September, we changed a lot of our messaging to how can we help the business community survive from what they've overcome uh, over the last six months prior. Um, and then our shop local campaign, which was a huge success, which we'll talk a little bit about later. So community engagement, even though we did not have the staff, we ended up hiring one full-time and one part-time student this year. In previous years, we would normally have three students, a full-time visitor services person, and the management of the chamber would also be doing DMO services. So in comparison, we had one and a half in, in lieu of what we normally have. Even though we'd had that, we still were able to do multiple events in the community and, and attend multiple events like the ones listed here. So I can't see it very well, but um, overall, we wanted to talk a little bit about our social media engagement. That was where we spent the most time in the, in the ability when we couldn't be out in the community. And one of the things I just wanna point out, we had a huge increase in our Instagram reach, which was great. We had a small decrease in our Facebook reach, but a lot of our readers, a lot of our followers are moving over to that Instagram platform. So that's a, a big success there. Some of the other kind of organic, you'll notice here on the fourth quarter that there's a huge increase in engagement 
that was the quarter that we were able to actually hire a full-time visitor services staff member. And so that's why you see that, that big increase. In addition, we were finally able to go back to events like Light Up Summerland. So that's another reason that you see an increase there. Overall, followers over the year have pretty, pretty much been consistent though. So into visitor services, year over year, you will see a decrease in the number of visitors, but the first slide here really talks about the number of hours of operation and total visitors. So hours of operation in 2020 obviously went down substantially, but we have climbed that back up, even though we have less staff. In the second one here, you notice from 2000, this is a five-year comparison, 2017 down to 2021, total visitors is down. And we know that across the board, but we are up from 2020. So that's, a, that's an exciting number to see. And we hope that that continues to go up as we kind of come out of the pandemic. Number of parties per hour and total parties, again, have increased slightly from 2020, but nowhere near the 2017 numbers, but we hope that that will continue to rise. Next up is our visitor guide. So even though we were coming off of a very closed 2020, we still invested in our visitor guide, which a lot of visitor centers have not done. A lot of them have reused previous guides to help spread their costs over multiple years, but we did invest in this again, and 16,000 copies were printed and distributed around the Okanagan and, and out across BC and into Alberta. So destination marketing, we really tried to make sure that our communications and our, our brand was consistent this year. So we were very lucky to be able to uh, access a grant through DBC that provided us the opportunity to do a brand refresh and a realignment. So these items here you may not see publicly yet. It was developed and then put on hold until the development of our tourism uh, strategic plan. But they are ready and ready to go as soon as we make sure that they align with what we've developed. <clears throat> so we developed a multi-layer marketing plan and did a brand refresh. We also developed Savor Summerland back, I think it was March and April last year that they shut down restaurants and made it all outdoors. So we tried to work with the different restaurants to find a way to entice people to still come out and utilize their services. So we created the Saver Summerland and it was put out there for a while. It's now back waiting for us, but, um, but that was kind of our response to, to that situation. Uh oh, so, I may not go through every one of these stats, but um, this is just some of the, the results that we received from our investment into the marketing campaign that we did last year. We saw some really great, um, great results from this, and we, we're hoping that with some new funding that we can apply for this year, we can start doing this on a consistent basis. But we did use multiple different uh, marketing tactics and resources to get some of the, the views that you see here. So, working with Saver Summerland and VCO, or sorry, it's okay. Um, we had multiple um, successes through all of these different uh, media sources, whether it be Castanet or Bell Media and whatnot. And we're gonna continue to work with them to see what we can do to increase that reach for Summerland. So one of the, my personal favorites, the industry partnerships uh, visit South Okanagan was a huge success. We'll actually, there is a year end report that they've done separate to this that I will be sending to you because it's got some amazing uh, success stories of what was able to be accomplished for Summerland as well as other partners in the region. But as you'll see from the stats, oops, as you'll see from the stats, 14 blogs were written, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 16,000 visits to the website. If you haven't checked out the website, please do. It does have so much information about Summerland and the region on there, and it's really, really interesting. We also participated in the retro photo contest um, and the Tripsy uh, app, which was a lot of fun for locals as well as visitors. Some other industry partners, obviously with 2021, we couldn't do the same amount of engagement as we're normally used to, but they still did their best to engage with us as delivery uh, operators. 
We will be going back to in-person um, tourism summits and whatnot this year, which will really help to provide education for our tourism students and managers to really help build on what we can do for Summerland. So the DMO realignment. This is probably the area where the most work has happened over the last couple of months. So the Board of the Chamber of Commerce has recognized that the tourism has its own standalone mandate and it needs to have its own budget and it needs to have its own dedicated staff. While we're still under the umbrella of the chamber as a contract, we wanna make sure that it's got dedicated capacity and, and finances. So the first part of that is making sure that we're working with the right partners and we're hearing from the tourism industry on what they need. So I wanna thank everybody in the room for allowing us to do our tourism advisory committee and subsequent uh, strategic plan. Without the district's support on that, we wouldn't be able to do it. And so we wanna recognize that first and foremost, we created, and we're still working on, uh, a tourism separate budget to allow us to be able to work with you and say, here's the reality of what the DMO and visitor services really costs to run in this organization. We will be presenting that to you in the coming months. The Tourism Advisory Committee is made up of 10 different members of the community, including a couple of members of staff from the district. We met twice now. Our second time we met with our facilitators to actually facilitate the creation of the tourism strategic plan. And we are still working on the outputs of that. We will be able to present to you over the next, I would say a month, would you say? Mm -hmm. uh, in the next month, we should have a draft of that plan to present to you. We're very excited about what they came up with. From there, one of the first and foremost things that we'll be looking at is putting dedicated tourism staff together. So making sure that besides our tourism visitor services st staff that we have right now, and a couple of summer students, that we have a DMO manager that will take on the direction of the strategic plan and move it forward. And that kind of falls into our new organizational structure. So we're very excited about this project and we hope you are too. So special projects. Thanks again to the district for helping us fund the Light Up Summerland. We were able to put together an amazing, what would you say, um, different version of Summerland Light Up. Uh, yes, yeah, so I unfortunately have not seen the other one, so this is the only one I know. Uh, but cert certainly the Light Up, uh, virtual Light Up was a huge success. The drive-by was a great success. We added three local shopping uh, Saturdays, which again, huge success from our, our members where we saw a lot more people coming into the downtown and just getting excited for Christmas. We partnered with various different organizations. Um, and yeah, overall, we hope to do this again uh, this coming year. Secondly, we were able to do a extension of this uh, through a grant. We were able to get $31,000 from the BC Chamber Shop Local campaign, which allowed us to do an extended version of Shop Local to really recognize that off season winter time uh, to really encourage people to shop local um, even after the holidays. So a little bit more about that campaign. It was an overall six week winter campaign. We did two different contests to try and en engage people to see how can we get more people into the downtown with two cash prizes of $1,000 each. We did the online paid advertising campaign, which we haven't actually done in the past to that degree. We haven't spent those kind of dollars online and the amount of engagement we got was astronomical, to be honest, where you'll see the report from Shop Local soon. We're just putting all the da data together. And we had over 50,000 uh, engagements in some of the, the ads that we did. And that's just not something we've seen before. So we're definitely excited about that. So as everyone's probably looking at the screen, you're looking at this sign going, this doesn't look like what they presented before. <laughs> and that's okay. I wanna recognize that what we heard in our presentation about the signs a month ago was that you supported our idea, but you wanted to 
see something a little bit different. And we wanted to recognize that. So we worked really hard with Brad um, and brought in some of the ideas that you guys had presented at the last meeting. Instead of doing the larger billboard, which I know is a horrible word, we looked at how can we make it a little bit smaller but still impactful, and how can we make sure that it really follows those directional sign guidelines that are set by the district. So here is what we've come up with. Please keep in mind the content on here is not perfect. <laughs> We originally went with the idea of going from one double-sided sign to six smaller six by eight signs. In order to really fit with your design, Brad had asked us to look at the, at the possibility of doing the black uh, metal framing. Unfortunately, with that, it does reduce the amount of signs we can do because the cost is substantially higher. So instead of six signs, we can put four together. So that's why I say the content's gonna change because we have to reduce down to four. But this is what we've come up with as a, a result of the feedback from council as well as working with staff to make sure that we're meeting everybody's uh, wishes here. So we're very excited about this. We hope that with council's support of the new design, we can work with uh, MOTI to start moving this forward. So, a couple of things, um, with the four signs. Sorry, would, would you take a question now or Absolutely, would you like? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, please go ahead, Councillor Carl, or uh, Trainer. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Aaron, yeah. Um, I just had a quick comment about the signs. I like them. I think that they're much better than what you, um, than what we saw before. Um, my only just quick comment, and I wanted to say it before we moved on, is they do remind me of um, BC Park signs. So, you know, when you're driving down the highway and for example, like Sonoka Beach is 5K ahead, right? Yeah. That's what they remind me of. So when you go to um, the Ministry of Highways, they might have that feedback as well. So that's just something to think about is that's the first thing that I thought of is it looks like a BC Park sign, but I still like them. I think they're much easier to read and they obviously match the ones that we have in town. So thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, it's good. So a couple of things uh, on those signs. Um, there, like I said, there is an increased cost for the metal framing. As I was driving in today, I was driving in from a Soyuz today and I was kind of scouting, you know, as a visitor, where would I pick up? Oh, that's happening in 200 feet or whatever. And, and there's some really great places that we can place this that entices people and it's readable and it doesn't need to be a 20 by 10 billboard, right? So I'm excited to see this come to, to life. I also feel, and I know I've, I've said this with Brad, is this is just a start. This is four, but we could add later as we find funding sources and whatnot to build this into a bigger program. This is just a way to kind of get it moving. And if MOTI is willing to support us in that, then it's not as hard of a process to, to add one or two signs later on. So the final wording and content the reason I stress that is that we, we definitely got a lot of feedback on the content last time and we want to let you guys know that this is really just concept. Um, because we have to go down to four, we have to be really careful on what those four signs are going to say. They're going to be the same on both sides of the highway, so there'll be really only two designs. Um, and we want to make sure that we're highlighting the most important pieces that we can that's going to entice people to get off the highway and explore. So a couple of our priorities this year, strategic plan rollout. So as soon as that strategic plan comes back from the developers, we'll be working on an operations plan, which is very key with our new DMO manager once we have them in play. I didn't mention this earlier, but agritourism accommodations program, we, we know that our, our previous uh, president really worked hard to come to council with the, uh, the program concept and council has supported that. However, because we had no staff, we weren't able to really facilitate any work on that in 2021. So it's a huge priority for 2022. And we want to let you guys know that we are working on that in the background and it's still a huge priority for us. The rollout of the new website and the rebrand, while it's sitting there waiting, we are ready to roll that out now that we've done the strategic plan. The hiring of the new manager, obviously that should probably be on the top of the list. Uh, the TAC development, we have 10 members now, but we need to develop as a committee and really start working together on what um, they've put together as a strategic plan. 
We also have a photography grant that is being currently worked on that is due at the end of March, which will develop some new photography for not just our website, but other assets uh, in the community. And then our shop local signage completion. So those are the things that we're working on now. This will evolve, obviously, as we open up from post-COVID. We hope that there'll be even more funding opportunities and more opportunities for us to really promote Summerland to the world. And that's everything. Any questions? I don't see any hands up, so maybe I'll start off. I just had one quick one. Um, just wondering if you have, you showed us the, uh, you know, this, understandably the, the drop in visitor um, visits in 2020, 2020, and then they're starting to rise in 2021. Mm -hmm. Do you have any forecasted projections for 2022? Like, do you have a goal that you're aiming for? Or have mm. you put thought to that? I would love to say yes to that. Um, shoot for the moon, right? Uh, I would, unfortunately, I don't. It would be something we're still waiting to get some some stats from TOTA, which will really give us a better understanding of the region, because I think as a region, uh, we'd be able to answer that better. But specifically to Summerland, unfortunately, I don't have that yet. But once those stats come available with TOTA, I will pass that on to you. It'll give you a better understanding of what they're expecting too. Good. That's great. Thank you. Councillor Holmes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Just um, um, curious curiosity uh, uh, regarding the visitor guide. Is that a, a profitable publication with advertising? We actually don't have the contract to actually sell the ads in the guide. We just provide the content and the updates. So that's a very similar agreement that a lot of visitor services uh, organizations have across BC with Black Press. So in the past, if you took it in-house, and this is my experience from previous uh, work with other visitor centers, taking it in-house, it can be profitable depending on your margins, obviously. But Black Press has a, a structure and a... Um, a system that makes it more uh, cost effective for the ad costs to do it through them for the businesses. If we were to do it ourselves, the costs would have to go substantially higher for the ads and it wouldn't really make sense to the visitor, uh, sorry, the, um, the advertisers. So we don't make any money off of it, okay. unfortunately. Right. Yeah. But you, uh, does but it cost you money? It does cost us money, yeah, because we have staff time that goes into mm -hmm. editing everything. We actually, all of the money that we put into the development of all of the photography, we then pass that on to be used and we don't charge them for that. So it's it's a, a money loss, but it's part of what we do to support visitor services. So doesn't sound like an ideal model. No, it's not. No. Unfortunately, that model has been in place for multiple years with Black Press having the ability to take that on. In some organizations, some visitor centers do still have a cost sharing agreement. Um, we don't have one like that here. There is an additional amount, an incredible amount of additional work that comes into play when you do have those cost sharing, and it doesn't always really come out as a dollar above, so. Okay, thank you. I have a follow-up question to that. The the final printed piece mm -hmm. is it available to the chamber digitally? Yes. And so it's like a swipe, like a lookbook kind of thing. Yes. Okay. Great. Thanks. Yeah. That's very valuable, as you know. Absolutely. Great. Other councillor Carlson. Thank you. Um. With regards to the South Okanagan Tourism Initiative, I'm just wondering uh, who pays for that and how much input um, does the actual tourism section that you work with have to what goes into their website and their promotions? Yeah, great question. So we all pay into, as partners in that uh, structure, we all pay a fee each year towards that, plus DBC also funds into the structure. So it's a cost-sharing partnership. Um, it's dependent on the size of your organization. So we pay a little bit more than, say, uh, Peachland or um, Penticton will have a higher share than we would. So it's a cost-share um, split. And then DBC is just approved um, to continue to support us for an, another two years. Do you know how much that annually is? 
we paid, it's $2,000, I believe we paid last year, or three? 3,500. Oh, sorry, 3,500. <laughs> Gotta ask the accountant, she knows. <laughs> um, now, having said that, because of the inability to do some of the things that they had wanted to do in 2020 and 2021, I don't believe that there is a fee for the for the coming year. DBC, because we didn't spend the money like we thought we were going to, we actually don't have to put that fee in for this year. And DBC has approved an additional two year support for us. So we will go back to putting that funding in for 2023 and 2024. Other questions or comments? I really like the signs too. Good. <laughs> and I just wanna, before we go, I just wanna recognize um, your staff, both Graham and Brad and Lori for working with us over the last few months with the development of the TAC, the Tourism Advisory Committee, the sign project, which we kind of threw on Brad's plate um, and just working with us overall. It's been a pleasure working with them. Um, it's nice to finally meet you guys all in person and we're looking forward to seeing how this year rolls, rolls out. Great, uh, thank you for those uh, words of confidence in the district staff though. We appreciate them here, but it's nice to hear that that you're appreciating them as well. Um, I, I will follow up with you on this question. Um, you may be aware that more or less twice a month, I write a council corner column for the Summerland Review. And um, I think that this would make a great story. So um, I'd like to follow up with you later, um, perhaps after you have formalized things a little bit more, and then um, I, I'll maybe interview you and then we can have a we can have a council column that way because um, not only is there input from council in what you're doing and the, the district uh, helps fund the work that you're doing, it is something that is beneficial to all of the people in Summerland. So I think it would be worthy of a column. I'm just looking over at our CAO. I always make sure that it's, it's good with him too. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for being here. And uh, again, it's really nice to, well, I've met you in person before, but it's really nice to see you in person in our council chambers again. Um, I will ask if we can receive this presentation for information. Uh, Councillor Patton, Councillor Van Elfen, all in favor? Great. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank so you much. Mayor and council. And we'll see you at the chamber uh, AGM on Thursday. Okay, thanks. Kendra, do we have anyone that would like to speak with us? Okay, so we'll go right on to the first of a few business items, 7.1, Emergency Support Services, ESS Grant Project Completion, and our fire chief, Rob Robinson, is speaking to this, of course, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Mayor, councillors, good afternoon. I put too much of this stuff on. Uh, today with me is, is Ann Ben, the uh, emergency coordinator for the RDOS to help me answer any questions that you might have. Um, before you is the request for decision for the Emergency Support Services ESS grant project, um, recommending that the District of Summerland participate in a joint grant application with the Regional District of Okanagan Similkameen, the Town of Asoyas, the Town of Princeton, and the Village of Karameas to the UBCM Community Emergency Preparedness Fund for ESS moder <clears throat> modernization and training in the total amount of $89,750. And that the District of Summerland Council supports the Regional District of Okanagan Similkameen to apply for receive and manage grant funding on behalf of the District of Summerland for emergency support services. There are no financial implications for the District of Summerland. The grant application and management of the project will be coordinated by the RDOS. District staff at district staff time will be requir required as part of the project, which will be me. 
Um, the District of Summerland is fortunate to have a strong and committed ESS committee. This request for funding will assist the district to better serve the residents of Summerland through an enhanced capacity for the delivery of emergency support services. Any questions? Any questions? Councillor Van Elphen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Question through to our chief. You said earlier, you, you, Oliver, OK Falls, uh, these communities aren't participating in this? No, nope. sometimes they will do their own grants. And that's what I believe one of them is doing on their own. Any other questions? Are you Anne? Oh, great. Nice to meet you, Anne. Sorry for those that don't know her. <laughs> uh, if there aren't any other questions, um, could I have, oh, Councillor Carlson, my apologies. Sorry, it's just quick. Um, so outlying area, area F is part of our DOS, but can, we would consider them Summerlanders. Um, so Summerland Emergency Support Services, if someone from that area wanted to be part of Summerland's team, is that like something that, are, that happens? Do we just count them as Summerlanders when an emergency happens in that neighborhood? Thanks for the question. Um, so typically what happens with our ESS teams is if you live within the area of Summerland and it makes most sense for you to be part of the ESS team in Summerland, then a member of the RDOS would join that team. Um, or if somebody was closer to Penticton and they wanted to be part of that team, then we would just encourage them to be part of the team that they're closest to. Thank you. Any other questions? Could I have someone bring forward the resolution for us to discuss? Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That the municipality of the District of Summerland participate in the joint grant application with the RDOS to the UBCM Com Community Preparedness Fund Emergency Operations Center and Training Program in the amount of 99130 and that the council endorses the regional district, Okanagan, Salokameen, to apply for receive and manage grant funding on the District of Summerland's behalf. Um, that's not the resolution that I have. <laughs> <laughs> this is for the ESS 7.1. Can I repeat myself? Yeah, yes, please, try please go again. ahead. My apologies, Madam Mayor, and to my fellow councillors. I just got really into it. I wanted to really hurry this along today. <laughs> uh, that the District of Summerland participate in a joint grant application with the Regional District and the Okanagan Slocumene and the Town of Osoyoos, Town of Princeton and the Village of Karameas to the UBCM Community Emergency Preparedness Fund for ESS modernization and training in a total amount of 89750 and that the District of Summerland Council supports the Regional District of Okanagan Smokemean to apply for, receive, and manage grant fundings on behalf of the District of Summerland for emergency support services. Thank you. I thought you were just making that up on the fly until, it, until you got to the figure amount, and then I thought uh, maybe we should stop this. Seconder for that, Councillor Patton. And further discussion? All in favor? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. And the other one's done already. Yeah, <laughs> do you want me to speak about it or should I just take <laughs> yes, over? Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the second one? Yes, please. Okay. The second one is the request for decision as well too for the Community Emergency Preparedness Fund for the EOC, also known as the Emergency Operations Center and Training. Staff recommends that the municipality of the District of Summerland participate in a joint grant application with the RDOS to the UBCM Community Preparedness Fund Emergency Operation Trainings, sorry, Emergency Operations Centers and Training Program, the amount of $99,130. And that council endorse the Regional District of Okanagan Similkameen to apply for, receive, and manage grant funding for the District of Summerland on its behalf. 
Again, no financial implications to the district of Summerland. Um, again, my time will be uh, needed for a little bit of the project. It is beneficial to the District of Summerland to submit a joint application with the RDOS in doing an EOC, Emergency Operations Centre training, can be provided regionally and regional-wide EOC protocols can be established. And that's everything for that one. Great, thank you. Any questions for, for our fire chief or for Ann? Okay. Oh, Councillor Holmes. Yeah, just a, a similar question to the last one. It, it, are any other municipalities participating uh, of the member municipalities? Yes, they are. The Oak, Oliver and Karameas. Last paragraph of the first page. Any other questions, Councillor Holmes? Okay, anyone else? Councillor Van Alphen, would you like another crack at this? <laughs> we gotta make sure we got the right one here this time. Uh, that the municipality of the District of Summerlin participate in a joint grant application with the RDOS to the UBCM Community Preparedness Fund Emergency Operations Center and Training Program, the amount of 99,130. And that council endorses the regional district of Okanagan Slocomine to apply at, for, receive, and manage grant fundings on the district of Summerlin's behalf. Thank you, Councillor Van Alphen. Seconder, Councillor Patton. Further discussion. I just wanted to say I really, I really like this one. Oh, I like the other one too, but. Um, there's always been some confusion and uh, maybe a disjointed communication around the uh, emergency operations, whether it's in Summerland or whether RDOS is. So I really appreciate that there's going to be a coordination of that whole protocol and process. This, that's a good thing. Yeah, I think Anne realizes that as well too. Yeah, so, that's great. Good. Okay. Um, I will call the question. All in favor? Any opposed? That carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We'll re excuse ourselves, so thank you. Okay, so following up on this morning's discussion around the community, sorry, the Okanagan Food and Innovation Hub, uh, we are going to talk further about the Memorandum of Understanding, and this will begin with uh, CAO Stat. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, <clears throat> so we're pleased to come forward with an update on our work regarding the uh, Food Hub, and particularly the uh, MOU today. The Food Hub is a strategic priority of Council, and while the District will not be operating the Food Hub, the intent of Council has been to support the research of the model, the identification of preferred governance models, and to seek grant funding that can support its creation to the benefit of the community. A business plan has been created which will help uh, position the venture for qualified uh, funding, and uh, a location and partner has already been decided by Council. The next key step will be to enter this uh, memorandum of understanding, which you have before you today, with the Garnet Valley Ranch and the Community Futures Okanagan Similkameen that spells out roles and responsibilities of the parties, agrees to the location of the hub, and which will structure the relationship with Garnet Valley Ranch as host of the proposed food hub. Future steps will necessitate the acquisition of equipment and engaging in a lease for the food hub and a nonprofit to be set up to guide its operation. However, none of those steps will be taken unless and until significant grant funds are obtained. There is no financial obligation on the district and its ratepayers to fund the food hub. We believe this business plan and its propo proposed governance approach will help the concept gather the momentum that it needs to see it come to fruition. With that, I'll turn it over to our Director of Development Services, Mr. Brad Dolman. Thanks, Graham. I'm just going to wait till the slides get on the screen. Thank 
Thanks. So uh, the creation of a Okanagan Food and Innovation Hub, or uh, of another name that we've been using over the past four years, has been a strategic priority of councils for the since 2018. And uh, just recently, we, we've had uh, some recent activities to propose a new business plan for the food hub to be located at uh, 26405 Garnet Valley Road, which is a Garnet Valley Ranch. And this is just a mock-up design of what it could potentially look like uh, once constructed and com uh, uh, developed within this, uh, that property at 26405 Garnet Valley Road. As mentioned, under this community resiliency pillar, the creation of the South Okanagan Agriculture Food Hub has been a strategic priority of councils since 2018. And the, the intent of this food hub is to help provide community resiliency and sustainability by encouraging value-added processing of local food to meet regional market demand, and also to encourage less dependence on global food supply chains for food security purposes within our region. The hub's mission is to build a uh, regional food, agri-food capacity and connect food and agri-tech entrepreneurs to the right resources so that they can develop and successfully commercialize and market new agri-food products within our region and locally. And a second point of our mission of the food hub is to help the, the regional communities of the Okanagan, so not just including the district of Summerlin, build a more sustainable and resi resilient food system um, that can be ecologically sustainable as well as economically robust in the face of supply chain uh, issues and shortages uh, within our region that are current, we're currently facing. The background of the hub, uh, just for Council's benefit here, um, in March 2020, we had the uh, South Okanagan Food Hub business plan developed uh, previously from our prior consultant. Uh, unfortunately, though, with that time, uh, with the onset of the global pandemic, the, a lot of the grant funding uh, um, opportunities that we were looking were redirected to COVID-19 um, support uh, funding. And so the project was on hold for uh, about a period of a year and a half. And it wasn't until July of 2021 when we received additional funding from Etsy, which is the Economic Trust of the Southern Interior to complete pre-feasibility activities this past July um, uh, did the project get reinitiated again by staff. And the, the, just to reiterate to Council, the, the pre-feasibility activities that we wanted to complete to more uh, fine-tune our business plan included the creation and management of an expression of interest process for a land building partner, the confirmation of partnership for that land building partner for the Okanagan Food and Innovation Hub, and also a revision of the Okanagan Food and Innovation Hub business plan to reflect that the new land and building partner and also potentially uh, create a, a phase one scaled down version of the uh, hub. In December 13, 2021, and following that expression of interest process, staff recommended that we enter a conditional agreement with Okanagan Crush Pad to locate the hub at 26405 Garnet Valley Road. At this meeting, uh, Council provided direction to negotiate a partnership agreement with Okanagan Crush Pad for the placement of the food hub at uh, 26405 Garnet Valley Road, but also to report back to Council on this draft partnership agreement prior to its execution. And so that second point is what I wanted to mention to Council is why we're here before you today uh, to present the draft memorandum of understanding uh, and to re receive Council's endorsement of that MOU before proceeding with its execution. So with regards to the business plan, I just wanna highlight some of the items uh, uh, mentioned this morning at Council's uh, Committee of the Whole. Um, we did have a detailed presentation from our consultants, uh, Green Chain Consulting and also their sub-consulting team. Um, as well in participation, we had Community F Futures Okanagan Similkameen uh, in attendance as well to answer any of Council's questions. Um, and uh, an overview was provided that included many elements of the business plan, including there's a number of plans within the business plan, a program and services plan, an operational plan, a marketing plan, and a governance structure and financial plan, which was all presented to Council. Um, 
The business plan is, itself is conditional on higher level grant funding. So this is not a for-profit business as council was made aware of this morning. And so therefore, in order for it to be a viable project, we are reliant on higher level grant funding to proceed with the food hub before moving forward with the business plan. And, and the consultants have, have determined that that higher level grant funding that we require to move forward is $2.25 million. Um, so it, it will require a significant amount of upfront capital. But by year five of operation of the food hub, it, the consultants project that the economic impact of the food hub on the regional Okanagan uh, food economy uh, is projected to directly contribute to regional food sales by over $12 million. And, and council heard that's actually perhaps a bit uh, of, of an underestimate, more like $13 million per year uh, for every year of operation uh, moving forward past year five. So with regards to the memorandum of understanding that's before council today, uh, this is a partnership agreement um, in principle with the following parties, the District of Summerland, the Community F Futures Okanagan Simokameen, um, Garnet Valley Ranch, which is the owner of 26405 Garnet Valley Road. The three parties together agree to pursue together the construction of a food hub facility located at 26405 Garnet Valley Road. As well, all parties agree through the MOU to ensure that this facility meets all relevant zoning, bylaw regulations, and, and or provincial approvals uh, that are required to place the building. And we've already had preliminary uh, discussions with the Air Cultural Land Commission in this regard. Um, other key points uh, of the MOU, um, this is a, a partnership MOU, so this is no, there's no financial commitments to, for the District of Summerland yet. All that we, uh, we are proposing from the district's roles and responsibilities include staff resources to go towards the project and in-kind support only. All three parties as well agree to pursue grant applications for higher level grant funding. Um, and as previously mentioned, the project will not be initiated without receiving higher level grant funding with, to the tune of $2.25 million. Garner Valley Ranch specifically is uh, responsible to construct and obtain an occupancy approval for the hub facility itself uh, following the raising of the funds and it would be their responsibility to go through that construction process and receive the approvals required uh, to complete the, the building for the hub facility. And additionally, uh, Community Futures Okanagan Smokamine is responsible for submitting grant applications and as well, they have offered to provide uh, additional financing and equity uh, support financing to the maximum amount of $300,000 to the placement of the food hub uh, at this location. With regards to the district's responsibility specifically, uh, we are proposing to work with Garnet Valley Ranch to provide all necessary approvals and permits that are within our jurisdiction to provide local oversight and management of a project manager and bring items for local consideration to council's attention when, when need arises. Um, we also wanna work closely with Community Futures Okanagan Samalkameen to secure the grant funding required for the hub uh, and the, the, the grant uh, funding that's gonna be required for the leasehold improvements to the facility specifically. <laughs> We also want to continue to advocate and apply for grant funding for the hub from higher level grants funding sources, including BC provincial level as well as federal level uh, grant funding programs. And then uh, as well provide space, uh, office, boardroom as, it, as required to the project manager, uh, any of the proposed clients of the food hub if space is not available at Community Futures Okanagan Smoke Mean. Just in terms of uh, next steps with regards to our business plan that, that was presented this morning, um, that in terms of the governance structure, we want to establish a trust between us and Community Futures, Okanagan Smokamine. That'll be a, a key next step. Um, Community Futures, Okanagan Smokamine is also uh, working on the application of a Pacific GAN grant, uh, which will be a federal level grant, and we are supporting them on that grant application. We are going to continue having discussions with the Ministry of Agriculture um, on potential grant funding programs that the Food Hub will be applicable to. 
And we will uh, support uh, a Garner Valley Branch slash Okanagan Crush Pad with the development approvals process, including the Agricultural Land Commission. But I want to be clear with, with uh, to council and also to the public that the district will not be proceeding with any hiring of staff or financial expenditure until a higher level grant funding is in place. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Councillor Carlson. Uh, thank you. Something that we haven't seen today is any talk about the government support for these food hubs. I know that all the other ones that have started up have either received five hundred or seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and there's been a process of um, to go through in order to actually become the qualified applicant. So I'm wondering if we know anything about whether that might be another opportunity, or if that's a program that's completely finished, or if we have no idea. Through your worship to Councillor Carlson, yeah, that's a great question. Um, we've had some preliminary conversations with the uh, Ministry of Agricultural uh, staff, which they manage the, the Food Hub Network program, is the Ministry of Agriculture, and um, there has not been any announcements yet uh, of additional funding for Food Hubs at this point in time. Um, and they were providing up to $750,000 uh, per Food Hub. Um, I, I am hopeful that we're able to find uh, opportunities for grant funding through uh, our discussions with the ministry staff. Um, they have just recently, the province has recently announced a new budget for 2022, um, where agri agricultural innovation was a key priority of the BC government. And we see this project being a strong fit with the provincial uh, BC's mandate with um, uh, agri innovation uh, being a, a key pillar of economic development and growth for the re, for the province. This morning's um, presentation showed um, a hope for I think it was three hundred thousand from agri from Ministry of Agriculture. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just want to make sure I had that right. Councillor Trainer, and then Councillor Van Elfen. I'm just wondering, do we have um, a timeline for this project in terms of, um, like, what happens if grants don't start coming in? Is there a point in time where we say, okay, we need to shelf this for a while, or, or what are we thinking around that? Through your worship to Councillor Trainer, that's uh, a great question. Um, I think uh, at some point in time, I'd imagine the landlord Okanagan Crush Pad will want to move forward with their building. Um, they 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 will uh, need some securities from us in terms of the lease space um, that will be required uh, for the food hub. Um, if we don't have the funding secure by that point in time, I think um, you know the 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 the, la the landlord could proceed at their own risk of, of building the, the of building just for their own needs only, um, and maybe we come in after the fact or it's designed for an addition in the future. Um, but other than that, I think this is something that we recognize that at least at the staff level we're we're not going to be able to achieve locally unless we do ach uh, achieve that higher level grant funding sources um, of capital for this project. So I think we'll continue to maintain and manage and provide resources and apply for grants to 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 see it become a reality but if we're not successful then it'll probably um not occur to be honest yeah i guess um the only concern is and i mean i, I guess everybody would have this concern is the fact that we do need several grants from di uh, several different organizations to come in kind of within you know relatively the same time period in order to make this go forward and so there's a lot of pieces that need to come together so I, that's just one challenge that i i guess goes without saying but something we have to think about councillor van elfen thank you madam mayor uh, as was I said earlier in the committee, the whole meeting this morning, number one is, you know, what if the farm is sold? And uh, the explanation I got this morning was, you know, there's a possible lease agreement, but the new owners may not want to honor that lease forever. So there's that concern. My other concern was, as I explained this morning, when the water twinning project took place in Garnet Valley, it was a six inch line to Wild Horse Road. And from there on, it's a three inch line that was spec'd 
for the existing houses and minor growth in the future. Um, so the water is definitely a concern, uh, domestic water to a facility like a food hub, I would expect that they, you would use a fair amount of water, processing vegetables and what have you. And then your photo here, like just the artist rendition um, from Wild Horse Road on, it is a minimum standard road. And the amount of traffic, five tons or larger trucks going in and out of a food hub is another concern. So I, I have a hard time supporting a memorandum of understanding until some of these answers, you know, like, are we going to have a traffic study? Who's responsible for possible upgrade of a road? Who's responsible for upgrades of water lines? Um, you know, so that's some of my concerns today, but I wanted to express them here in the meeting that the public can hear it. I don't think the community of the whole meeting was recorded this morning. It wasn't streamed live. Thank you. They they aren't. Um, Brad, did you wish to respond to those comments again? Yeah, thank you, Worship. Um, so the memorandum of understanding is is just a, a preliminary agreement of what we are going to do together in terms of our responsibilities at, uh, for each partner. Uh, so it, we're, I've already provided what our uh, responsibilities are for the District of Summerland, but uh, one of the responsibilities for Garnet Valley Ranch would be to go through the uh, approval process for the placement of this building at their location. Um, and that's entirely their, um, their responsibility uh, uh, as being the landlord uh, of this facility. So through that process, there would be an, uh, an opportunity to review any traffic impacts as well as the impact to the district's water system, uh, whatever risks there are with regards to the placement of the food hub at their location uh, with those uh, issues, if uh, traffic and also the state of the current Garner Valley Road, um, that, th that would be theirs to manage. And so there, the district wouldn't be held liable at all, any, uh, in signing this memorandum of understanding because we're making them aware of that that is their responsibility and they need to walk through that process themselves. Um, I think that, that the MOU does provide us the ability to proceed with those next steps of learning more about the site as well as being able to have us ready for grant applications to seek that higher level grant funding, which is something that was a stumbling block with, with previous grant applications was not knowing where this uh, building was going to be located within the district. So it's definitely my recommendation that at the least this point in time, we signed the MOU uh, uh, for, for the District of Summerlin, and then we start working on understanding what those finer grain details are um, with Okanagan Crush Pad uh, as a project partner. Um, just before I go to you, Councillor Patton, it, it does state in the MOU, and I guess this maybe has a little bit um, to go to what Councillor Trainer was, was asking. It does state in the MOU that um, the district will continue to work with Garnet Valley Ranch and CFSO um, under this memorandum of, of agreement. Um, to determine um, the, that this project, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll just read it. MOU will remain in effect from the effective date of the agreement until the OFIH, the food hub becomes operational or until the district and the CFOS determine that the project will not proceed or until a period of two years has passed. So there is some some timeline in there on you know when we give up this process that's been going on for four years already brad yeah another out clause we all i just want to point this out to council as well i didn't have it in my presentation is every any party can provide 30 days notice to the, the other two parties to remove themselves from the agreement so there is also that out clause as well to provide notice within 30 days of removal from the agreement Okay, and Councillor Patton. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, 
I, I'm going to the exactly what you were just speaking of, and that's the terms of understanding in the memorandum. The very last sentence indicates that um, if uh, the Garnet Valley Ranch were, uh, undertakes any major financial commitment, that this MOU will be converted into an offer to lease document, which will be signed by the three parties. So I guess my question is, is there will, if this was to proceed, there will be a financial, um, would there not be a financial contribution of some sort from the district, which is not really spelt out in, in this? It's, it's saying that if it moves forward, we have to sign a lease with the Garnet Valley Ranch, but my understanding is, is that we're not part of it. We're helping them move forward to um, achieve the food hub. But in this memorandum of understanding, it's saying that we have to be part of that signed lease. So I'm not sure, I, 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 I don't understand it is, is I guess where I'm going with that. Through your worship to Councillor Patton. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the, the, the reason that's in there is to provide security to Garnet Valley Ranch that, that they don't have to proceed with the building unless they have a lease agreement in place. Um, uh, as a, 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 and that lease agreement is intended, and that's why there is a draft in the appendix, to be with the operator of the food hub, not with the District of Sunglan, uh, which, which was, as presented this morning, is going to be a not-for-profit society um that would be uh called okanagan food hub society or something like that would be the operator of the the food hub and so that's just to provide security to garner valley ranch of their interests that they do not have to proceed with constructing a building unless they have a, a signed lease agreement in place but it doesn't bind any party to actually signing that lease agreement um it, it, we're, we're stating within the mou that everything is conditional on grant funding we're making that very clear to Garnet Valley Ranch and also uh, Community Futures Okanagan Smell Community that we won't, will not be pr proceeding unless we have that higher level grant funding. Um, so, um, and th this MOU does not bind us to have to sign that lease agreement if even if that grant funding comes in. Um, it's just protecting Garnet Valley Ranch that so they don't have to proceed with construction until they have that lease agreement in place, if that makes sense. Uh, thank you. Um, th then my question is, it says, it, um, which will be signed by the three parties. It does not say may be signed by three parties. So my question is, the um, when you introduct will to it, that means that we are bound to do it. It's not, it, you've taken it out of um, you shall, you may, it is you will. So I, it's, I realize it's a very small word, but that small word ties us greatly into it. Councillor Patton, could I just ask you to direct me or maybe the rest of us to what is what, what exactly you're looking at? Because I can't yeah. find it in the MOU. Um, it's where you were speaking of in the terms of understanding when you spoke of the MOU will remain in effect. It's the Oops. very last sentence. In that first paragraph? Yeah. It's the same portion where about the two years, Madam Mayor. Okay. I thank you. I'm just gonna see if I can find I see it now, thank you. No problem. Madam Mayor, uh, we we can you know if it offers some additional certainty for council, we'll just change that to offer that clarity. Um, and uh, you know whether it's the word may or would be signed by the nonprofit association or whatever the case may be, we can we can certainly uh, clarify the intent of that sentence as Brad was uh, dictating. Okay, there is somewhere in the package because I, I've read it, where it speaks about the lease and it shows Garnet Valley Ranch and the representative of the Okanagan Food Innovation Hub, which is not the district of Summerland. Um, but I can't find that right now either. So thank you. If, if that provides the clarification that you're, that you're looking for, then that's good. 
Um, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, uh, to our CEO, that would, uh, thank you. That would, that would work. Yeah, we'll just make that change. And I think where you're, re you're remembering, Madam Mayor, is it's on the appended um, draft lease agreement just below the part you were. Right. That the signatories are the uh, nonprofit and Garner Valley. But we'll just clarify in the agreement itself this point. In the, yes, in the MOU. That, yeah. That's a fair comment, and certainly we can do that. Good. Then it'll be crystal clear. Okay. Any other questions? Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. When it gets back to that point of discussing leases and what have you, will we be going into closed at that time to have these discussions? Uh, yeah, at that point in time, I, I keep in mind the governance structure that we are proposing as part of the business plan is that uh, we would have a trust um, that set up um, that would have the assets of the equipment that needs to be purchased for the, the building, but may not be the entity we want to uh, enter a lease arrangement with um, uh, the landlord. We may want to wait until we have enough funding in place. We have, uh, as well, we have the not-for-profit society set up, as well as that not-for-profit society is, has uh, uh, maybe hired their first staff person being a project manager. And therefore, we can make them go through the lease arrangement uh, process. Um, and it may not be something we need to be a party of uh, entirely. And so it'd be up to the two parties to determine of. And keep in mind, again, going back to the governance structure, that that not-for-profit society would be managed by a independent board of directors, which we may not be a director to, or have a be a sitter on the uh, on that board of directors. Um, and there could be other industry stakeholders. There could be lo local businesses that are involved in the food hub um, uh, themselves directly that will want to sit a, 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 on that board of directors that can evaluate that lease arrangement themselves and determine if it's a good business decision for themselves before proceeding. And we don't have to be a party to it. So no need to put it in closed because we wouldn't be part of it. Okay, any other questions? All right, could I have someone bring forward a recommendation, please? Resolution. Councillor Holmes. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll bring forward the staff recommendation. Should I say as amendment? Yeah, okay. Um, so that uh, the mayor and corporate officer be directed to sign the uh, memorandum of understanding as amend amended with Community Futures, Okanagan, Smilkameen and Garnet Valley Ranch to locate the Okanagan Food and Innovation Hub at 26405 Garnet Valley Road. Thank you. Seconder? <laughs> Councillor Carlson? Further discussion? Councillor Holmes? Um, so I, I realize or, or, or believe that this isn't the ideal location, certainly when we first uh, started conceptualizing a food hub, we weren't thinking that would be stuck at the end of Garnet Valley Road. But, you know, we've been at this for an awfully long time. This is what we've got to work with. And I, I think it's uh, time that we move it forward. And uh, so I'll be supporting us. Uh, I would s just also say for uh, grant funding that we <clears throat> might um, want to talk about what what we should be doing um, at a political level to to help us obtain some grants, um, whether that's UBCM meetings, uh, updating our MLA and MP um, on so that they're aware of what grants we're applying for. I think all those sort of things could help. Thank you. It's already been done <laughs> and continues to be done. Isn't that right, CAO Stat? Yes, he's had good conversations with the MLA and MP. Uh, Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. As per the, the resolution that mayor and corporate officer be directed to sign a memorandum of understanding, Madam Mayor, do you have a conflict as a leasing land up in that farm? I'm just asking for clarity, that's all. Uh, um, 
I don't believe I do have a conflict. Um, and I can't really ask for guidance because <laughs> it's my decision whether or not I have a conflict. And uh, I don't I don't believe that I do. Thank you. You may recall that I was not part of the decision to place that up there. Um, so I think that having council having made that decision, that um, that decision was, I was not part of that decision. Um, I have to say though, I'm pretty happy that this is finally getting underway, uh, potentially anyways, uh, and that it is going to be located in Summerland as we have worked on, not we, but others, other agencies and uh, certainly district staff for uh, a number of years, including the Chamber of Commerce. It's been a long time. So um, any other items to discuss or are you ready to call the question? All in favor? And none opposed. Okay, so that carries. Thank you. Thank you for patiently waiting. <laughs> Lori, our Director of Community Services. Uh, the next item on our agenda 7.4 is Parks Regulation Bylaw Number 2022-12. Please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good afternoon, Council. The purpose of this Council report is for Council to consider providing three readings to a new Parks Regulation Bylaw to replace the current Parks Regulation Bylaw number 95-013, as well as corresponding amendments to the Bylaw Notice Enforcement Bylaw and the Municipal Ticketing Information Systems Bylaw. The current Parks Regulation Bylaw was adopted in 1995 and has had two minor amendments in 2007 and 2008, and it is provided in the Council Agenda Package as attachment number two. Staff have flagged this bylaw for review and updating and have taken a step to process in developing a new policy for Council's consideration. Over the last six months, the following items have been completed. A review of other municipal parks bylaws, including Kelowna, West Kelowna, Penticton Peachland, Revelstoke, Souk, and Cowichan Valley. Consideration of the recommendations outlined in the 2018 Parks and Recreation Master Plan. Consideration of recommendations outlined in the 2020 District of Summerland Recreation Land Use Planning for Outdoor Tennis, Pickleball, and Dogs in Park Report. Presentation and input provided by Council at the October 12, 2021 Council Meeting. Presentation and input provided by the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee on October 26. A draft bylaw was circulated to park user groups and the Summerland Dog Owners Association for review and comments and interdepartmental input from the District of Summerland staff. The Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee discussed the parks bylaw in detail at their October 26, 2021 meeting. They made four resolutions. The first one was to recommend not to include Giants Head Park with the parks listed to allow for off-season, off-leash dogs. The discussion points included the environmental sensitivity of Giants Head Mountain, concern of damage to environmentally sensitive areas if off-leash dogs are allowed, <laughs> safety concerns on multi-use conflicts on trails and roads, safety concerns with young children and off-leash dog encounters, a few members did note their preference to allow off-leash dogs in the off-season, but the final resolution was passed to not recommend dogs off-leash during the off-season as a permitted use. The second resolution was to recommend not to expand the list for all year on-leash dogs to be permitted in all parks, which Council pondered at their initial meeting. There was agreement by the committee that pocket parks and neighborhood parks such as Julia Park and Kinsman Park are too small to allow off-leash dogs. The third resolution was a recommendation to add Peach Orchard Campground to the list of parks to allow off-season off-leash dogs. 
The committee noted that use at your own risk signage for the campground could be posted. The campground property should be large enough that damage may be minimal and recommended monitoring for damage. And that uh, it's a good site with natural surroundings for off-leash dogs in the off-season. And the final resolution was recommending to permit horseback riding in Conkle Mountain Park. There was committee support to permit horseback riding, especially with Conkle Mountain's natural connection to the Summerland Rodeo Grounds. This is also a recommendation in the Parks and Rec Master Plan. The main questions and concerns that were brought forward from user groups were around restrictions of vehicles in parks for loading and unloading equipment and supplies for events, as well as the use of vehicles to assist with dragging ball diamond fields. There were suggestions to restrict dogs around equine events at the rodeo grounds, which has now been noted, and um, a recommendation to permit horses at Horse Beach, which will be referenced in an upcoming slide. The Summerland Dog Owners Association provided a detailed response to the circulated draft parks bylaw document. They highlighted their continued advocacy for access to public outdoor spaces for dogs and their owners through bylaw updates, as well as reiterated the need to implement a year round fully fenced safe and accessible place suitable for dog owners to exercise and play with their dogs. The association provided some suggestions around definitions and penalties and fines as well as specific requests to permit dogs at district owned portions of Cartwright Mountain, Peach Orchard Campground during the off season, Giants Head Mountain Park and Horse Beach. They also recommend allowing dogs at Living Memorial Park and a portion of Dale Meadows Sports Complex on a temporary basis until the provision of a year round off leash park suitable for exercise is established, at which point these options could be reassessed. As previously highlighted to Council, staff recognize that vehicles and parks cause damage to grass, sports field turf, tree roots, trees and park infrastructure such as irrigation. It is recommended that vehicles are restricted in parks unless essential to the event and only with staff approval through the park permitting process. Staff have included language in the bylaw noting that exceptions can be made as approved in writing through the park perm permitting process with the inclusion of event maps and on site meeting and no vehicle zones to protect park green spaces and infrastructure. Staff will work with event organizers to review options to mitigate potential park damage for any required vehicle access. Current regulation around dogs in parks state that no person shall cause or permit any animal to be on any park except where permission has been granted by municipal bylaw or has been attained from the council. Dogs shall be permitted in Peach Orchard Park between October 1st and May 1st each year with the exception of playground area and Spirit Square gazebo area. This language is extremely restrictive and provides very few opportunities for dogs in our municipal parks. Based on consideration of recommendations from the 2018 Parks and Recreation Master Plan, the 2020 District of Summerland Recreation Land Use Planning Report, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee and the Dog Owners Association, the updated parks regulation bylaw significantly expands opportunities for dogs to be permitted in parks. It states that dogs are permitted on, permitted on leash year round at Memorial Park, Dale Meadows Park, Living Memorial Park, Peach Orchard Beach Park, Powell Beach Park, Peach Orchard Campground, Giants Head Park, Conkle Mountain Park, Cartwright Mountain and Summerland Rodeo Grounds except on sports fields, sport courts, skate parks and beaches or near playgrounds and spray parks. It also states that the dogs are permitted off leash during the off season, uh, October 1st to May 1st at Peach Orchard, Beach Park, Powell Beach Park, Peach Orchard Campground, Conkle Mountain Park, Cartwright Mountain and Summerland Rodeo Grounds except around equestrian events and activities. And it also states the dogs are permitted off leash year round only at designated Summerland off leash dog parks. And currently that would be the dog beach at Peach Orchard Beach Park and the temporary dog park at Dale Middle Sports Complex. Changes what was from what was originally drafted for council input on October 12th council meeting 
uh, is the addition of Cartwright Mountain for on leash year, year round and off leash off season, Peach Orchard Campground for off leash off season, and the removal of Giants Head Mountain Park for off leash off season. The recommendation from the Summerland Dog Owners Association to include portions of Living Memorial and Dale Meadows sports fields for temporary access has not been included in order to protect the sports field turf from damage as recommended by staff and the 2020 District of Summerland Recreation Land Use Planning Document. As far as horses and parks, the bylaw does not include references to permitted uses at Horse Beach as this property is currently being reviewed as part of the Summerland Waterfront Concept Plan. The results of that plan will provide recommendations around dogs and horses at that location. The bylaw states, no person shall cause or permit any animal to be in any park except as outlined in this section, unless otherwise posted by the District of Summerland. And the current posted signage uh, at Horse Beach does allow for horses. The proposed bylaw has added horses are permitted year round in Conkle Mountain Park and at the Summerland Rodeo Grounds. Uh, prior to proposing to include horseback riding on um, the district owned lands of Conkle Mountain Park as a permitted use in this updated bylaw, staff have verified with the province that the neighboring Crown land does uh, permit horses. It was confirmed that the area is considered vacant Crown land, hence all recreation is permitted, including equestrian. The full rewrite of the Parks and Recreation, or the Parks Regulation Bylaw includes updates and inclusions as pre previously presented to Council, including regulation on watercraft, commercial uses in parks, special events and park bookings, chattels, inclusion of clauses from other municipal park bylaws, and removal of clauses which are covered in our other municipal bylaws. The bylaw delegates authority to the Director of Community Services to grant permission and issue permits in accordance to this bylaw. An amendment to both the Municipal Ticketing Information System bylaw and the bylaw notice enforcement bylaw are required to allow bylaw enforcement staff to enforce corresponding sec sections of the proposed parks regulation bylaw and issue municipal ticket information as required. They are included as attachments to the report and bylaw officer Dan Maya is here if you have any questions about those amendments. The new parks regulation bylaw includes updates to reflect recommendations and best practices. Once the bylaw is adopted, staff will be working on educating the community about new regulations around dogs in parks and updating the park signage. That concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Laurie. Councillor Holmes. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just for, for clarification um, for Horse Beach, uh, as it is signposted there that it's okay for horses, um, that will continue at least until we've, we've uh, reviewed the waterfront master plan. That is correct. Thank, thank you. you. Councillor Carlson. Oh. <laughs> Councillor Trainer. Okay, you're next. Um, Laurie, I just have a question for you. So dogs in parks, I don't know what slide that, I think it's number nine, um, where you have the new wording. Um, so dogs are permitted off leash during the off season. And then it says, um, except um, equestrian, I can't say that word, <laughs> events and activities. Should we add in playgrounds there? Because even during the off season, kids play at the playgrounds and I don't know if we want to be having dogs running around playgrounds. Um, so I'm just wondering if that should be added into that section. Uh, through Madam Mayor to Councillor Trainer, uh, the intention is that dogs are not permitted around sport courts, skate parks and beaches or near playgrounds and spray parks for all sections. So. Um, I can have a look at that to see if we need to be more clear, but that is the intention. Okay, I think, yeah, because um, I was just reading that that, where you just listed off those things, that that just applies to on, oh, I see what you're saying, okay. Um, if you think it's clear, then that's fine. I'll, I'll double check. Okay, thanks. Councillor Carlson. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, it's a question that I've brought up before, and I think maybe uh, our CAO might have an answer, but the folks who call themselves the Summerland Dog Owners Association, my understanding is that as a Summerland resident with a dog, there's no way to actually join an association called the Summerland Dog Owners Association. It's simply a Facebook page. Um, and so I just wondering if, if we as council or as the district of Summerland have any sort of policy on input from a special interest group, or if they need to be a formal association in order to have as much um, screen time and influence as the couple of people who are the association are seem to have. Not that I don't want them to have input, but I do think that it needs to be fair um, and that if I want to be part of that association, I can go ahead and do that, but I don't believe there is a way as a dog owner for me to actually be part of a formal membership that ha that has a nomination for their president and their, you know, that it's, I just, I just want to put that out there. Um, don't want to start a fight with them, but I certainly want to make sure that we're aware that there's no, I don't think it's formal. Yeah, thank you through the mayor. Uh, you're correct, Councillor Carlson. It's, it's a loosely uh, coordinated uh, association, not a formal association under any for, uh, regulation or other instrument. Uh, basically, the members are those that follow the, the association, in quotation marks, uh, web uh, Facebook site. However, um, we, they do uh, make quite an effort to to engage and receive feedback on their own surveys, this sort of thing, and have been um kind to give us the results of those uh surveys we're not often asked for our input on what the questions are but we are given the results and uh do touch a fair number of users and and dog owners in the community so so i i guess that just to say you know with with the several hundred people they'll typically engage um and providing that input I don't think we're giving them unnecessary screen time, but we 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 are wanting to hear from them because they're they've coordinated that. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, I hope that their surveys are helpful then in the process we're going through. Thank you. Other questions, Councillor Patton. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Lori, I, after reading the old bylaw and the new bylaw, I must say that uh, the new proposed bylaw uh, does uh, uh, does open up a lot in regards to where you can and cannot now uh, run your dogs at certain times, and which our other bylaw was strictly it was strictly forbidden. So I, I think this is a, a a great step in in actually working with the dog owners community. And uh, and uh, I, I think this is uh, this is a great step. Thank you, Councillor Carlson. I just want to just put in there that the reason I bring it up is that there's some things that they've recommended that aren't going forward in this, and I I guess my concern is that it's going to come back as council. You know, wasn't we once again council hasn't said this is where our permanent dog park is going, and council is against dogs and and I just want to understand that um, that's not the case. You know, there's been input, it's been presented, we've read it, but unfortunately there's a couple things that the Dog Owners Association group has asked for that won't be in this bylaw. And um, I think that that's just something that needs to be accepted and stated out loud. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor, or sorry, CAO Stat. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, uh, through the mayor to Councilor Carlson, I think you make a really good point. And so I think what we can do, you know, subject obviously to decision making today of council, um, most of the information we get from that dog owners association is sort of one way. Uh, they're gathering information, giving it to us. We have met with them from time to time. I think what I could do is, is uh, create a letter that I ask for them to distribute from us to their uh, membership or those whom they engage with. That, that does clarify the intent of the decision and what we are doing uh, for dogs in the community, if that's of assistance. Great, Councillor Trainer. So I think if we are going to open up our parks to dogs officially, um, that we are going to need to put in more um, 
garbage bins and um, doggy bags for sure, because um, that's a huge issue down in Trope Creek is the amount of um, dog poop that's left um, at Powell Beach Park and along the Trope Creek Trail. So I definitely think that we're gonna have to make a small investment in the number of um, garbage cans and bags that we provide for the public. I'm glad you brought that up, Councillor Trainer, because I have my annual rant. <laughs> um, I, I, I first thought of this when uh, Lori was talking about um, the giant's head not being off leash in the no, yeah, not not being off leash in the off season. Um, personally, I'm disappointed, but Ranger hasn't been able to go up there for several years. But, um, but at the same time, um, perhaps we, and I'm being a little facetious here, perhaps we could have um, an on-leash time for the people that are destroying Giant's Head by refusing to stay on the trails. They're making a lot more damage to the environment there than the dogs are. And please, just because it's snowing, or you know it's gonna be hidden by the snow, there's lots of poop on Giant's Head too. And it's, it's disgusting. If you're gonna take your dog up there, there's, there, there are bags there, there's a waste receptacle there, there's more than one race waste receptacle. If you're gonna leave it by the side of the trail as you're going up, fine but pick it up on your way down, please. So that's all I'm gonna say about that. Now, um, one thing I wanted to ask you, and that was a comment that you made, Lori, about um, the recreational use on Conkle Mountain and allowing, you know, make, making sure that horses, horse owners know that they're able to participate in that recreational activity as well with their horses. Um, is Conkle Mountain is, it, it doesn't allow, or does it allow any non-motorized, sorry, motorized recreation? Um, Madam Mayor, are you referring to the district owned lands? Yes. It's non-motorized at the KVR trail that goes through um, the, the north section of Conco Mountain is non-motorized. It's signed and that was a decision made by the District of Summerland. Um, so I'm not talking about what you're calling the KBR trail. Is that is the, that the same as the Trans Canada Trail? Yeah. Okay, not talking about that trail. I'm talking about the trails that are on Conco Mountain. And there are, you you know that too. There there are lots of them, and up, it's up the very it's very nice. Um, there's not a whole lot of room on the trails for motorized vehicles, but certainly um, you go off the trails. Uh, there's lots of room. So it, with that being formally designated, at least part of it, as a municipal park, is is there any motorized uh, recreation, recreational activity allowed up there within the boundaries of the designated park? Um, Madam Mayor, the majority of the trails of my understanding um, that go up the mountain are crown land. It's, it's kind of uh, the lower lands are the District of Summerland and as you go higher you're, you're on crown land of uh, province. Um, and really any recreational use can happen on that mountain. So e-bikes are permitted and, and there isn't anything up there that says no motorized as far as the, the crown lands up there. I, I'm up there almost once a week. I haven't seen any motor out, outside of e-bikes. I haven't seen dirt bikes or ATVs in that area um, myself. But uh, if we went to the province, we would probably find out that it, it's not a non-permitted use up there right now. Um, as far as our lands, the only signed lands uh, are uh, that Trans Canada Trail, which says no motorized. Okay. 
I've only seen e-bikes up there as well. It's just, it's a little concerning if you have horses up there with uh, with motorized vehicles, but um, I, I guess horse owners are used to that kind of terror. Um, okay, any other questions? Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you. So Living Memorial Park, dogs aren't allowed on the sports fields. Are we gonna try to, like, because I, I read lots of complaints from uh, Minor Baseball Association of dog waste in the middle of the ball fields and what have you. So are we going to monitor that in the short term just to make sure that people aren't on the sports fields? Because <clears throat> it seems to be an out of the way park. And I think people are just like that out of sight, out of mind. And they just let their dogs run on the ball fields and then, you know, Saturday, little Johnny's there playing baseball, and there's a mess. Uh, through Madam Mayor to uh, Councillor Van Elfen, uh, the intention, uh, if this passes and, and we are moving forward with this bylaw as written, uh, we would be updating signage and doing education around it. And this gives our bylaw officers a little bit more tools about uh, appropriate locations where dogs can go. And so I think it'll be easier uh, for bylaw to do more enforcement to um, ensure that dog owners aren't on the Dale Meadows sports fields, they're not on the Living Memorial sports fields and the other locations that we've indicated um, are not permitted uh, for dogs. And um, we'll try to do our best to do education in the community about these new this updated bylaw and focusing on the positive of all the great locations that we have identified as uh, locations for dogs and uh, moving them along in the areas where they they shouldn't be. And with two of the bylaws that are we will be uh, bringing to the table moment, momentarily, having to do with bylaw enforcement and ticketing, is there anything that you would like to add, Dan? The only thing I could add is uh, one of the things I noted when I got here was that there was no usage of compliance agreements in your bylaws. It's a very powerful tool with the bylaw notice enforcement program the province put in. Uh, so as, as we're going through and reviewing these, I'm putting those in. So essentially what that is, is you get a fine. If the person comes in, pleads guilty, agrees to a number of conditions, so comply with our bylaws, you have that extra chance to have an education, although we would have already done that out in the field. And then it halves their fine amount. So some of them fine amounts are a little bit higher, but that's because they've got a compliance agreement assigned to it so that we can have that in-depth conversation with somebody and they accept that they shouldn't be doing that. Uh, they sign an agreement and we have the fine. It just, it's a little extra to put back on the people. Uh, it's one of the things I'm really hoping to bring out in a lot more of the bylaws as they get amended. Uh, it's a very useful tool. Like in our short-term rental bylaw. Mm -hmm. All right, Graham. Oh, it, it, um, I'll go to you, Councillor Trainer, and then I'll come to you, uh, CAO staff. Just a quick question. So um, if we adopt these, um, or sorry, do third reading today, would we have like maybe a week or two or something um, where we would focus on education, like where perhaps you would be at the parks and um, just so that people can start like, um, you know, start to be more aware of this and. Yeah. Yes, um, uh, Madam Mayor, the, so our bylaw enforcement policy focuses on education first. Uh, and that's doesn't matter what bylaw we adopt. Uh, so their goal first is to have that educational component. Uh, it's when we start recognizing people's names uh, as repeat offenders, then we start getting into the enforcement. But definitely uh, education is a key, has to be. Uh, the rules are always changing, so we always have to be educating. The other part of that is we'll have to reach out to our contractor who does dog control to make sure that they're on the same page as myself. But yes, definitely we'll want to educate first. Okay, good. Yeah, I know I think these changes are good. And I think as long as we've got some uh, good signs at all of our parks that are really clear, like on leash during this time, off leash during this time, and then next to a little um, doggy bags and garbage can, I think if we have that all together, that will be really good to help people 
so that everybody's clear and even people who don't like dogs they can go to that sign too and know and know what they can expect thanks see you stat thank you your worship i've had the chance now to review the section uh, councillor trainer was referring to earlier regarding uh, sports courts and uh, playgrounds and such forth uh, I actually think that that section uh, 6C probably should uh, have a sentence added to it so we're abundantly clear that in the off-leash, off-season element, we still don't want dogs in places like sports courts, um, near playgrounds, spray parks, and to be 100% to be clear. And uh, if that is, of course, assuming that council agrees, that is the intent in, in both the the summer and winter uh, effort is to keep dogs out of some of those areas. So you're suggesting leave it in 6B, but add it to 6C as well? Yeah, I would suggest basically on 6E, we would uh, include the sentence starting at except on sports fields, sports courts, skate parks and beaches or near playgrounds and spray parks. Right. In 6C. In 6C, okay, great. Um, any further, no, we, we haven't gotten to there yet. So any further questions? Okay, Councillor Trainer, would you like to bring this to the table? Sure. Now, everybody ready? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> um, that, Parks Regulation Bylaw Number 2022-012 be read a first, second, and third time, and that bylaw enforcement, oh sorry, and that bylaw notice enforcement amendment bylaw number 2022-014 be read a first, second, and third time, and further that municipal ticketing information system bylaw amendment number 2022-015 be read a first, second, and third time. Thank you. Seconder, Councillor Van Elfen. Oh, so sorry, Councillor Turner. Did you mean first, second, third, first, second, and third time as amended? Oh, yeah. oh yes, I forgot to mention that. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Thank yes, you. thank you. And Councillor Van Elfen, you're still seconding. Good. Okay. Uh, any further discussion on this? All in favor? And none opposed. Thank you. Okay. It says. 248, let's take a break until three o'clock and then we'll carry on with the rest of the meeting. Thank you.
Um, on to 7.6, Council Remuneration Task Force, Terms of Reference, and this is for Kendra. So thank you, Madam Mayor. At the February 28th, 2022 Council meeting, Council directed staff to draft a Terms of Reference for Council approval outlining what the, what the Task Force on Council Remuneration will review and make recommendations to on the ba and the basis for coming up with those recommendations, the number and composition of members and the staff support that will be provided and other relevant factors in the terms of reference. Uh, so before council is a draft terms of reference for consideration, the terms of reference outline that the task force will be comprised of three members of the public chosen by the chief administrative officer to make recommendations with respect to the guiding principles for council remuneration, appropriate remuneration, including base salary and per diem amounts, benefits offered, allowances and expenses, options for making periodic adjustments to the established remuneration and the standards for remuneration review. The task force finally will make its recommendations to council by the way of a report no later than June 30th, 2022. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. Questions for Kendra? All right, would someone like to bring forward the short and sweet recommendation. Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think I have the right one. That Council Renumeration Task Force Terms of Reference be adopted. Thank you. Second by Councillor Patton. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor? And opposed? Councillor Holmes is opposed. I guess we haven't heard any further from Councillor Barkwell yet. No, I haven't either. Okay, so that is that carries then. And um, the next one, Federation of Canadian Municipalities Conference, this is for Kendra as well. Thank you again, Madam Mayor. So the 2022 uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities Conference will be held in person from June 2nd to 5th in Regina, Saskatchewan. There is an option to attend virtually as well. And in accordance with Council Policy 100.6, Section 4.3 states that members of Council that wish to attend FCM, the FCM conference require the prior approval of Council. So before Council is a blank recommendation um, for those Council members who wish to attend to put their name in. All right, questions? No questions? Okay, would someone like to bring forward? Let's see, how do we do this where well, there's no names in there? It, it's uh, if any of members of council would like to attend, now would be the time to indicate okay. that, and then it would be the recommendation that council or, you know, or whichever um, be authorized to. Would be. anyone like to attend? Councillor Van Elfen. I'd like to nominate Councillor Barkwell. <laughs> <laughs> I have never been to an FCM conference, so I would like to go. Anybody else want to join me? Or anybody want to join me? Yeah, Regina, hmm. but you, you never know. You really enjoyed the last one. I think you went with Councillor Holmes, right? It was in Quebec City, yeah. Okay, uh, would, if there's no, Councillor Van Elfen. I'll bring the resolution forward, Madam Mayor, that Mayor Boot be approved to attend the 2022 Federation of Canadian Municipalities Annual Conference and Trade Show in Regina, Saskatchewan from June 2nd to June 5th, 2022, and that expenses related to participation in the 2022 FCM conference be reimbursed as stated in the district reimbursement of expenses policy 100.1 and the district council travel attendance at conference policy 100.6. Thank you, Councillor Van Elfen. Second, <clears throat> excuse me, second, Councillor Holmes. Further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Thank you, that's unanimous.
Um, I, I can only attend if I can get a flight back on the evening of the 5th. Thank you. Okay. Um, and Kendra, again, for adoption of building bylaw number 2022-002 and associated related bylaw amendments. Great, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so the building bylaw and all the associated bylaws, sorry, I just need to get it pulled up. Um, so the, the building bylaw and the fees and charges amendment bylaw, the bylaw notice enforcement amendment bylaw and the ticket information utilization amendment bylaw received third reading on the February 28th meeting and is now before council for adoption. Okay, thank you. And Brad is here if there are any questions. Okay, could I have someone bring forward adoption of those bylaws, please? Councillor Carlson. I will move that the building bylaw number 2022-002 be adopted. The fees and charges amendment building permit fees bylaw 2022-007 be adopted. The bylaw notice enforcement amendment building bylaw offenses bylaw number 2022-010 be adopted and the ticket information utilization amendment bylaw building bylaw and good neighbor bylaw bylaw 2022-011 be adopted thank you seconder councillor holmes thank you any further discussion I thought I was going to sneeze. All in favor? None opposed, so that carries unanimously. Thank you. Anyone waiting to speak with us? No. Okay, uh, could I ask for a resolution to close the meeting? Councillor Van Elfen, seconder. Councillor Holmes, thank you, Councillor Holmes. All in favor? Great, thank you.